Terrific. Good morning, everybody. This is Mark Erkin, and I welcome you to our Friday morning uh, virtual journal club. Um, I, it is really a pleasure for me to introduce um, uh, Dr. Uh, Joanna Kubo Gwadzinska, um, who is an MD PhD at the National Institute of Health. She is Alaska tenure track investigator and the acting chief of the thyroid tumor and the functional thyroid disorder section of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. She is also the principal investigator on four clinical protocols. Um, Joanna's major interest is in optimizing thyroid cancer diagnosis and therapy with the goal of improving morb morbidity and mortality of thyroid cancer care. And uh, Dr. A. L. Robenstock, for those of you who have participated in um, this, form, this forum, um, uh, Dr. Robenstock has been a frequent uh, presenter, and for that we are incredibly uh, grateful. He comes to us from Israel, um, where he is an endocrinologist and thyroid cancer specialist at the Rabin Medical Center in, um, in Israel. He is the head of um, the Thyroid Cancer Service at the Davidoff Cancer Center. Um, Dr. Robenstock's area of research interest is on individ individualized risk stratified thyroid cancer management. Um, as a result of his research efforts, he was awarded the Lindner Prize by the Israel Endocrine Society. So uh, uh, Dr. Robenstock, I welcome you back and thank you for your time. And uh, Joanna, thank you um, for your time and effort. And with that, we will go ahead and get started with this morning's program. Um, and uh, just encourage everyone to please um, send in your questions and I'll do my best as always uh, to get to them before the end of the session. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this Friday's Journal Club. Uh, I'm going to present to you this case by, of, of a 39-year-old female with a, history of fam with a family history of papillary thyroid carcinoma. She comes to a routine checkup, and during the consult, she asked her attending physician if she should have a neck ultrasound performed since her mother was diagnosed with thyroid cancer around that patient's uh, current age. At this time, you explain to your patient that screening for familial non medullary thyroid carcinomas is indicated. Um, a, never, since it could lead to overdiagnosis and treatment of thyroid nodules with low risk sonographic features. B, only in patients with one or more family members with PTC. C, only in patients with two or more family members with PTC. And D, only in patients who, have, who present with symptoms. So we're going to give you a couple of seconds to um, answer to this poll. Okay, Joanna, we can get started here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. I have some uh, problems right now with uh, putting it uh, on the uh, full screen mode. <clears throat> okay. Uh, are you able to see uh, uh, everything uh, okay? Perfect. Excellent. Right. Great. So uh, again, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for the nice introduction uh, and your kind invitation. I'm truly um, happy and honored uh, to present uh, the paper that we committed a couple of years ago uh, and focus on screening and familial non medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, and uh, let's start with some background information. So familial non medullary thyroid cancer accounts for approximately 3 to 9% of all non-medullary thyroid uh, cancer uh, patients. Um, <clears throat> it uh, usually is characterized by autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance with very variable penetrance. Um, we could um, further divide uh, familial non-medullary thyroid cancer, which for um, uh, uh, easier uh, um, going through the rest of the slides, I will just refer to as FNMDC. Uh, 
it is further classified as non-syndromic or syndromic form. Non-syndromic FNMTC is much more common than the syndromic one. <clears throat> Uh, importantly, while molecular basis of syndromic FNMTC is uh, grossly known, uh, the non-syndromic one um, is, uh, is an area of uh, active investigations without clear-cut culprit uh, molecular basis for it and without any genotype-phenotype uh, correlation uh, that is identifiable. <clears throat> So let's briefly review uh, both forms of FNMTC, syndromic and non-syndromic one. And uh, if there are fellows uh, uh, in the, um, uh, as attendees, uh, I will point out uh, some of the uh, information which could potentially occur on boards or has in the past. So uh, um, majority of syndromic forms of FN FNMTC are associated with autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance and we can uh, find p10 hamartoma tumor syndrome uh, including Calvin syndrome due to p10 uh, uh, tumor suppression gene uh, inactivating mutation germline inactivating mutations and um, these patients uh, are characterized by presence of follicular thyroid cancer uh, rather than papillary thyroid cancer uh, Pat Seeger's syndrome, uh, again, due to inactivating germline mutation and uh, tumor, another tumor suppressor gene, LKB. Uh, something that may occur on boards, uh, familiar adenomatous polyposis, so these families which have uh, more than 100 polyps er at early uh, age, due to germline mutation and APC gene, so these patients are characterized by presence of um, typical uh, histological form of uh, papillary thyroid cancer called Cribri form papillary thyroid cancer. A carny complex, um, you know, this is um, uh, well known to endocrinologists uh, uh, syndrome because it leads to uh, overactivation of uh, certain gla glands, growth hormone excess, cortisol excess, uh, however, in carnal complex patients, uh, we can also observe uh, uh, thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. And BICER-1 syndrome, another autosomal dominant one, which is more commonly associated with uh, multinodular goiter, but uh, thyroid cancer cases have also been described. Of note, and importantly, majority of these syndromic forms uh, are characterized by similar aggressiveness and similar response to therapy as um, uh, sporadic thyroid cancer. There are some forms of uh, recessive uh, syndromic FNMTC. Uh, they can co-occur with Pendred syndrome, so your um, <coughs> syndrome associated with congenital hypothyroidism and uh, deafness. Um, um, ataxia to angiectasia also could present with thyroid cancer and uh, where um, in very rare this disorder Werner syndromes uh, which is just um, an progeria syndrome uh, due to mutation is the NWRN gene this is the only syndromic form of thyroid cancer that has been associated with more aggressive uh, forms of thyroid cancer including presence of uh, uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer. Again, this is the um, progeria syndrome, so we may um, have more aggressive uh, tumors uh, because of that. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, though, uh, the uh, molecular basis for non-syndromic FNMTC is largely unknown, so this is terra incognita. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, what uh, have we learned thus far? Uh, that no clear-cut susceptibility genes have, uh, have been yet identified. There were several um, candidates, uh, FOXD1, HAPD2, uh, uh, telomere telomerase complex, uh, locus 4Q32, um, uh, TTF1, uh, MKX2, translocation, but um, those variants in candidate susceptibility gene have been found only in a single kindreds, um, so not rep reproducible in larger cohorts of FNMTC patients. Uh, so they have not been validated as uh, you know, common occurrence among, amongst FNMTC uh, cohorts. 
And moreover, uh, not all of these candidates were segregating with affected members of kindred uh, with FNMGC. Uh, so uh, what's uh, going on in terms of uh, exploring molecular backgrounds uh, for uh, FNMTC? Some alternative mechanisms of inheritance are being considered, like polygenomic, uh, similarly to diabetes, or uh, epigenetic, uh, epi epigenetics could play a role in etiology of uh, uh, FNMTC. <clears throat> So, um, uh, since um, um, we do have uh, uh, more information uh, on syndromic uh, forms of FN FNMTC, uh, ATA commented on uh, what uh, one should do if we, if we know about germline mutation, those ones that I mentioned, in particular families. So, what uh, ATA proposed was that uh, syndromes associated with uh, thyroid cancer warrant screening based on various components of that syndrome. Oftentimes, it is colonoscopy because many of these syndromes are associated with, with colon tumors. However, the panel cannot recommend for or, ag or against ultrasound screening uh, for these families since there is no evidence that it would lead to uh, better morbidity or mortality. So um, this question, um, in, in, th there is no evidence that we would change the, the disease course with screening. And again, a part of the reason for it is uh, that um, more aggressive behavior of syndromic FNMTC has not been uh, identified apart from, from patients with proberia. <clears throat> How about screening in families with non-syndromic FNMTC? So what's ATA's uh, in recommendation one, actually, <laughs> their first recommendation of the guidelines say about it? Screening people with familiar follicular-derived differentiated thyroid cancer may lead to an earlier diagnosis of thyroid cancer. But again, the panel cannot recommend for or against ultrasound screening since there is no evidence that it would lead to reduced morbidity or mortality. <clears throat> so uh, if that's the case, let's uh, ask the following questions. So what are the goals of screening and what conditions need to be met in order to uh, consider screening? So first, uh, familial disease should be more aggressive than the sporadic one. Screening would result in detection of the disease in, at the earlier stage. Early diagnosis um, should have an impact on subsequent treatment outcome with respect to all cause mortality, cancer specific mortality, and or quality of life. And of course, screening should be cost effective. So what do we know about the aggressiveness of, uh, of thyroid cancer or of NMTC? So there are conflicting, conflicting results, and one of the meta-analyses which was done a couple of years ago by, by Wang et al., uh, which included uh, 12,000 uh, patients, uh, um, and which were derived from 12 study, studies, uh, again, all retrospective. Eight of them were cohort studies, four of them were case control studies, revealed a significant heterogeneity uh, between uh, these studies. Uh, and so although uh, the overall um, take home message was that the recurrence rate was higher uh, for FNMTC um, uh, patients compared with uh, sporadic uh, cases, again, you can see here how uh, diverse, uh, heterogeneous these studies uh, were. Uh, and same holds true for um, looking at the disease-free survival. Again, a median uh, follow-up time in this study, in this meta-analysis, was ranging between one and a half to 12 years. Um, again, although uh, ultimate um, um, conclusion was that disease-free survival was lower in patients with FNMTC, but again, a very significant heterogeneity amongst included study studies existed. So the bottom line, the data are conflicting here. <clears throat> So, um, as I mentioned, the, um, uh, this meta-analysis meta was focusing or on retrospective uh, studies, either cohort studies or case control studies. 
So uh, at the NIH, we have a protocol uh, uh, looking prospectively at the cohort of patients with familial non-medullary thyroid cancer, and this is the article I was asked to present. <clears throat> So uh, what's the goal of this clinical uh, study? It's a prospective screening study in patients with FNMPC aimed at identification of individuals who benefit from the screening, assessment of the impact of screening on detection of thyroid cancer, treatment utilization, and treatment-associated morbidity. Um, the uh, um, paper that has been published a couple of years ago already focused on, uh, on the cohort which was enrolled between 2010 and 2015, so I will limit discussion to, to this paper and to this period of time. Uh, the uh, following patients uh, were included, and the ones who had uh, at least, uh, so uh, in, in order to meet inclusion criteria, there needed to be a presence of at least two first degree relatives affected by non medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, patients needed to be older than seven years of age, and we excluded patients with syndromic FNMTC. Again, our goal was to look at non syndromic FNMTC because there is no culprit molecular uh, uh, pathogenesis and uh, if screening is to be implemented, it's purely clinical, uh, clin clinical based. <clears throat> so what have we analyzed? Uh, pedigrees, uh, physical examination, imaging studies and laboratory tests. These were obtained from uh, included patients. Uh, all pathology slides uh, were reviewed at our institution to confirm thyroid cancer diagnosis. At-risk family members were screened yearly by physical examination and ultrasound. And uh, thyroid nodules larger than 5 millimeters in size were biopsied, biopsied under ultrasound guidance. And here, uh, one could already ask a question, why uh, five millimeters was a size threshold? So I would like to uh, um, point out that uh, at that time, 2009, uh, uh, ATA guidelines were followed, and this was the recommendation uh, from the previous guidelines uh, for the patients with familial uh, uh, history of uh, thyroid cancer. So hence the size threshold. Since then we have learned a lot and the size threshold with the newer guidelines was moved to one centimeter. But uh, this is the reason why uh, you will see this, this size threshold in our cohort. <clears throat> so uh, how many patients, how many families were included? Uh, 2,500, uh, 12 families had two members affected, 13 families had three or more members affected by papillary thyroid cancer. And amongst these, you can see that seven families had three members affected, three families, four members affected, and there was one family each, which had five, six, and eight members affected, respectively. <clears throat> the total uh, number of patients, both affected and unaffected at enrollment, or, was 252. Uh, 69 patients had diagnosis established uh, um, before enrollment, so we, uh, they did not undergo screening. We knew about their history of thyroid cancer, among which uh, we had uh, appropriate data for 56 patients. While uh, 183 um, 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 patients were unaffected, at risk individualized, individuals that underwent screening. So let's first focus on these 56 patients with established diagnosis of thyroid cancer. Uh, were there any differences in families uh, with two or three members affected in terms of tumor size, the presence of, presence of gross extratoidal extension, central neck lymph node metastasis or lateral neck lymph node metastasis? No, uh, these groups were comparable at baseline. Uh, so right now, let's take a look uh, at these 183 unaffected at-risk individuals, individuals. So 62 belonged to family where two members were affected and we screened 72% um, of them. And 121 subjects were coming from the family with three or more affected members and we screened a little bit more than half of them. So in total, 109 uh, patients underwent uh, yearly screening with physical examination and uh, ultrasound. Uh, um, thyroid nodules were common in this cohort. More than half uh, of uh, patients uh, um, who were screened presented with thyroid nodules by the neck ultrasound. 
Uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, particularly high in uh, parental generation. So in older patients, 73% uh, had thyroid nodules. In first and second generation uh, to the index case, um, this prevalence was ranging between 50 and 60. And uh, also young, youngsters, young patients were um, characterized by significant proportion of individuals with thyroid nodules. Uh, so, uh, the earliest uh, presentation of thyroid nodules in our cohort was at the age of uh, seven. Um, in regards to um, malignancy, the youngest patient with malignant uh, um, thyroid nodule with thyroid cancer was 18 years old in our cohort. And you can see here the outline of the prevalence in each generation. So the, the mean age of individual, individuals with thyroid nodules was uh, 36. <clears throat> Half of them pre presented with a single nodules, while the remaining uh, group had either two nodules or more, as uh, listed uh, over here. Uh, the average size of the thyroid nodule detected at screening was um, um, ranging between 0.2 and uh, 3.8 centimeters. And uh, importantly, thyroid nodules that were detected just by palpation, by physical exam, were detected in uh, only uh, seven uh, out of 55 patients with the nodules. Moreover, none of them uh, was malignant. Uh, so again, speaking uh, about uh, sensitivity of our fingers uh, in comparison to a thyroid ultrasound. In regards to uh, thyroid nodules that met the criteria for the biopsy over the course of follow-up on average 42 months, so after first screening ultra, uh, uh, ultrasound, 71% um, <clears throat> of nodules that met criteria for the biopsy were biopsied. And after the second screening ultrasound, uh, additional one nodule was biopsied because uh, it grew in size. Uh, after third screening, we detected two uh, new nodules and uh, also the nodule which grew in size. And again, after fourth and fifth screening, uh, we performed additional biopsies again because of the nodules were growing in size. <clears throat> the average size of the thyroid nodule, uh, uh, oh, I, I mentioned this already. Um, so what were the results of um, uh, biopsies? Um, in uh, 12 patients, the biopsy results were consistent with papillary thyroid cancer, and we had this Bethesda 3 and 4 category in six patients. Uh, in four patients, biopsy was actually non-diagnostic, and 19 patients were characterized by a benign biopsy. So what have we done with this information? Uh, so, uh, after first screening, uh, six patients um, um, with PTC underwent surgical treatment. Uh, however, uh, three patients had non-diagnostic biopsy here, and uh, uh, two out of three actually uh, were also treated surgically, although uh, because of the characteristics of the nodule by the ultrasound. Um, <clears throat> after the second screen, uh, one patient uh, had PTC diagnosed by cytology and was treated surgically. Uh, after third screening, again, either PTC or indeterminate nodules was treated surgically. Uh, after fourth screening, there were patients with non-diagnostic or benign biopsy, which were just followed without surgical intervention, while patients with in indeterminate nodules were treated surgically. And same hold it true uh, for uh, the fifth screening uh, with thyroid ultrasound. <clears throat> All patients who had thyroid cancer or indeterminate nodules were treated surgically. Um, so among those 23 patients which underwent surgery, six were found to have benign disease, while 17 presented with uh, PTC. Um, and so what's, uh, what's important is that diagnosis of thyroid cancer was established after the first screening uh, in uh, slightly less than half of the patients. Uh, which uh, suggests that if you decide about screening, you should not stop after the first evaluation because you are detecting cancer uh, also later, uh, later on after second, third, fourth and fifth screening. Um, though we need to do it every single year, so how, what was the growth velocity of these nodules? 
it was very slow. Uh, so uh, the cancer nodules would, would grow between 0.1 to 0.5 centimeters per year. Uh, so therefore, this yearly screening may not be necessary. Some longer time uh, interval, intervals might be uh, warranted as well. Uh, what's expected since we uh, applied a screening strategy uh, is that peak incidence uh, is a decade, decade earlier than in general population. So we compared our cohort with a SEER cohort, uh, which uh, includes patients with thyroid cancer, and found that the peak incidence for uh, FNMTC uh, was at the age between 30 to 39 as compared to 40-49 in um, uh, sporadic thyroid cancer. Um, so uh, what have we found? That um, um, screening resulted in detection of uh, thyroid cancer in uh, less than 5% of patients coming from family, families with two first degree relatives affected. So this is uh, no different than uh, um, prevalence of thyroid cancer in general population. And indeed, this is in line with uh, some probability estimates, which were published several years ago by Charks, uh, who claimed that uh, if you have two members of the families affected by common disease, such as thyroid cancer, relatively common disease, such as thyroid cancer, the by chance occurrence uh, is even up to 60%, uh, while this by chance occurrence goes down when three or more members are affected, goes down to less than 6%. And indeed, uh, we uh, also found that uh, um, screening resulted in detection of uh, thyroid cancer in 23% um, of kindred with three or, uh, or more members of the families affected. Um, uh, the question is, okay, uh, were those families with uh, two or three or more members affected different uh, in terms of age, gender? They were not different. And the screening strategy in terms of the number of the ultrasounds performed over years was also not statistically significantly different. <clears throat> In regards to uh, uh, clinical and pathologic features of patients with thyroid cancer diagnosed by screening, uh, what's important? Uh, there were no differences in terms of age, gender, histologic type. Uh, what was found was uh, a smaller tumor size and uh, um, a smaller pre prevalence of uh, central neck lymph node metastasis. Um, there were also no patients with lateral neck lymph node metastasis and extratoidal extension, although um, it might be clinically significant, but uh, it is not statistically significant. Uh, because we were detecting um, um, smaller tumors, uh, uh, less advanced disease, um, uh, also the treatment applied was less aggressive, so uh, for patients who had unifocal small uh, lesions, hemiterodectomy was performed in 13% of patients. Uh, also, we utilized less radioactive iodine. Uh, and at um, 18 months follow-up, excellent response to therapy was better uh, for um, um, cancer detected by screening compared with uh, patients with established thyroid cancer diagnosis at enrollment. Uh, however, um, as I mentioned, the follow-up uh, was just 18 months on average, so we cannot comment on a recurrence rates or cancer-related death. <clears throat> In regards to complications, um, um, we have observed transient hypocalcemia in 13% of screened patients uh, and no permanent uh, detrimental side effects as opposed to patients with diagnosis which was established uh, at enrollment for whom we had uh, data on complications in 41 uh, patients only, not the whole cohort. Um, so some of them uh, had permanent hypothyroidism, one patient, and uh, one patient had vocal cord paralysis which resolved and the other paralysis because of the extratoidal extension tumor affecting the uh, laryngeal nerve. So again, uh, this does not meet criteria of statistical significance, but could be potentially clinically significant. 
So uh, to summarize, a higher rate of thyroid cancer incidence uh, in screened at risk uh, members of the families with three or more first degree relatives affected um, was detected in our study. Uh, and hence, uh, we postulate that FNMTC diagnosis is better justified for kindred with at least three members affected by thyroid cancer. Again, uh, if only two members are affected, it still could be a by chance occurrence. Uh, screening with palpation uh, is not sufficient, as only 12.7% uh, of our patients had thyroid nodules detected by palpation. Uh, screening resulted in the detection of disease in the less advanced stage, leading to the utilization of less aggressive initial treatment. FNMTC peak incidence was a decade earlier than sporadic thyroid cancer, which could be just due to the ascertainment bias associated with active screening strategy implemented in our study, or through different biological behavior of FNMTC. Uh, all FNMTC detected by screening were microcarcinomas, but some of them uh, associated with uh, central neck lymph node metastasis. So if we would go back to our initial questions, what are the goals of uh, screening and try to address it based on this paper. So uh, is familial disease more aggressive than sporadic one? Conflicting data. Screening results in detection of disease at uh, um, uh, an earlier stage. Yes, uh, we have found that. Uh, early diagnosis has an impact on subsequent uh, treatment outcome with respect to all-cause mortality, cancer-specific mortality, and or quality of life. So we cannot comment on that because there are no long-term outcome data available. Um, maybe we could uh, make a case for potential reduction of treatment-associated morbidity, um, less radioactive iodine used, but again, um, the data are insufficient, the numbers are too small, and the follow-up is too short to comment on that. Uh, screening for cancer is cost-effective. Yeah, we know that ultrasound uh, of the thyroid is relatively cheap. However, there are no uh, robust cost-effectiveness studies to, to claim that. So again, we have insufficient data here. Uh, uh, what are the limitations? Uh, what else we need to take into consideration uh, while um, postulating some uh, recommendations. So although less advanced disease was detected as results of screening and surveillance, it's not uh, clear whether such an approach would result in a, a lower rate of recurrence and thyroid uh, cancer-related mor morbidity and mortality. Or on the other hand, uh, it would result in uh, over-treatment um, of, of such patients, <clears throat> which will put them at risk uh, for uh, uh, complications uh, and decreased uh, quality of life. So this is unanswered and this is a balanced question, specifically in view of the fact that more than 50% of thyroid surgeries are performed in the US by low volume surgeons. So to conclude, uh, screening with thyroid ultrasound, if we are considering, should be considered in families with three or more relatives affected by thyroid cancer. Since peak incidence of FMDC was at the age of 30, 39, uh, it is reasonable to uh, advise uh, a screening 10 years uh, earlier at the age of 20 to 29, or 10 years earlier, the, the earliest presentation in the family. Uh, screening should be considered in all generations because we were detecting thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer in all generations, and uh, not necessarily yearly. I think every two to three years is, is sufficient given the growth velocity of the nodules. Uh, however, it should be uh, uh, a repeatable uh, if we decide that uh, we, we, we are going to apply screening as only 47% of thyroid cancer uh, was detected at initial first screening. With that, I would like to thank you and introduce some members of our lab. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Joanna, for a wonderful presentation. And I'll continue from here. Hi, I'm Mia Robinstock. And the next around 15 minutes, we'll discuss the controversies regarding screening and treatment, um, which starts where 
Joanna uh, finished. And we'll mention uh, the, the study by Joanna many times. And the data that I'll present were uh, recently published like two months ago uh, with Professor Castagna, a critical review. So that means that all the studies that I'm going to mention, we just read recently and went over all, all the data. These are my disclosures. So first, if we ask ourselves, should we screen patients with familial disease? So before we can ask, answer that, we need to ask ourselves, should we screen anyone with uh, thyroid cancer? So is it advisable to screen in the general population? So Joanna mentioned the ATA guidelines that were neutral on this question, but in 2017, the US Preventive Task Force, that's a very uh, distinguished body, uh, went over the literature regarding thyroid cancer to evaluate whether screening is advisable or not. So what they found are several interesting uh, conclusions. First, there's inadequate evidence that screening improves health outcomes. That means if we screen and we find someone with PTC of one centimeter, we send them for surgery, how did we help him? So did we save their lives? Did we prevent some health outcomes? We really don't have the evidence for that. Uh, Population-based screening, and they mean South Korea program, resulted in no change in mortality. So they treated, treated a lot of patients and didn't see change in overall mortality from thyroid cancer. And therefore, the benefit can be bounded as no greater than small. So if we find early stage thyroid cancer, maybe we prevent some outcomes, we're not sure. But the magnitude of overall harm is at least moderate. And that we know. So patients go to surgery, they have a diagnosis of, of cancer with all its implications, financial, psychological, they have a scar, some of them have complications, some need lifelong medications. So overall, the recommendation is that the harm outweighs the benefits and they recommend against screening for the general population for thyroid cancer. And that's, I think, is a consensus within our field. Now, the question is, when we think about familial disease, how is it different? So what needs to be different for us to say, okay, it's not like the general population, this time we do, we do need to have screening. And we can think of two um, points, two areas to explore. First is prevalence, what's the detection rate? Because if you do an ultrasound to a, a million people in the population and find three patients, then it's not worthwhile. If you do an ultrasound to 10 people and find three patients, maybe it is. So detection rate is important, but even more important is severity. If they have more severe disease, maybe we can save them um, some complications later down the road. So let's talk about these two topics within screening, and then later we'll ask ourselves whether we need to treat these patients differently. So in terms of prevalence, in order to know the prevalence of screen in a screening program, we need a prospective screening pro uh, project. And the study that we are discussing now is the best uh, in the literature and only one out of two. So what Joanna just uh, presented, when you have two members affected in the family with thyroid cancer, if you do screening, you find thyroid cancer in 4.6%, which is about the same as you would find in the general, general population. You have the, the references here. So in the general population, if you do an ultrasound, you would find thyroid cancer in about 4.5%, so about the same. However, if you have three or more affected patients in a family, it's a different story. You have 22% uh, chance of finding thyroid cancer. One in five will demonstrate uh, a thyroid cancer that was unsuspected. That's a huge number. And if we look at the other study from Spain by Rios, they had mostly two affected families with two affected members. Only one 
family out of 10 had three affected members. So again, detection rate was 5.5%, which is similar to the general population. So the question is, how uh, are the two groups so different? Why families with two affected members uh, have such a low detection rate and with three or more affected members have a much higher detection rate? And an interesting answer to this question was presented in 2006 by Charles et al. Joanna again mentioned this study, and they used a fancy statistical model, Bernoulli's trial model of exact probabilities. They took large uh, databases and they asked themselves, if you have two patients in one family with thyroid cancer, what are the chances that there are just two sporadic um, patients who happen to be in the same family? Overall, it's a common disease. So if you look at two members in one family, 62 to 69 percent, that is just by chance that they are within the, the same family. 62 to 69 percent would be uh, sporadic cases, and only a minority will be cases that are uh, unexpected, that would be uh, explained by a genetic tendency. But in families with three or more, it's a different story. Less than 6% would be by chance, because think of it, have, having three sporadic cases within one family, the chances are very low. So in these families, there is a genetic tendency that may also explain the high uh, frequency that we find when we use a screening program. Now, prevalence is interesting because one in five is a high number, so maybe it's worthwhile looking for it, but it doesn't change the overall understanding of benefit versus harm. Because if we think about South Korea, they diagnosed uh, tens of thousands of patients and didn't see uh, and did, haven't proven uh, the benefit, the, the mortality was the same. So you can ask yourself, okay, take this graph, make it even higher. So the detection rate will be even higher, but if it's the same disease that behaves the same way, indolent disease, we're not sure if we're saving anyone, that you might be in a position where you diagnose more and more without affecting mortality. So prevalence by itself, as long as it's exactly the same disease with the same biology, is not sufficient to, to say that we need to screen. What I think, that's my personal uh, opinion, is when you treat a family and they have three or more affected members and they come to clinic and ask them, ask you, okay, so are my children at risk? Is my brother or sister at risk? Can you tell them the risk is one in five, they're gonna have an ultrasound. So even before we go to whether the disease is more aggressive or not, I think in three or more, uh, affected families, it's going to be really hard to tell them not to do an ultrasound uh, when you know that the chances are so high. You just need to take care not to overtreat them. And that's what we're going to talk about later. So the next question, okay, with three or more affected members, we have more um, uh, patients that we find. What's the severity of the disease? Is familial non medullary more aggressive? at presentation. So there are many studies. Some say presentation, disease at presentation is more aggressive. Others say it's the same. But all these studies are without screening. Because when you do screening, you're going to find smaller disease. You're going to find early stage disease. All of these studies were just patients that were detected in, in clinics or detected in, in large cohorts. Uh, so they're not representative of, of what you're going to find when you do screening. So with screening, and again, uh, the, the study that we're discussing now, when they did screening, they found less aggressive disease. So they found small disease, and no lateral lymph nodes, no extrathyroidal extension. So overall, the disease that they found was early stage. And if we think back, the at the U.S. Preventive Task Force, the balance between the benefit and harm, we really don't know 
if treatment in, at such an early stage of disease really has long-term benefits. So to summarize screening, uh, the ATA guidelines is neutral for familial disease. With two affected member, members, there's insufficient data to recommend screening both in terms of detection rate and both in terms of aggressiveness. And with three or more members, what well, is reasonable to recommend screening, again, I think if you know the chances are one in five, it's going to be really hard to tell them not to have an ultrasound. How often? Well, that's a matter for discussion, as Joanna said. Now, the question is, okay, so you screen them, these families. What you do have to take care is not to over-treat them when you find early stage disease. So the last topic that we have is treatment. And the question is, should we treat them differently? Should they be treated more aggressively? And here it's really important to differentiate between presentation versus response to therapy. You can think about two uh, clinics, like doctors sitting in clinic with you. One has uh, more aggressive patients with more aggressive disease, Dr. A, then Dr. B has patients with less aggressive disease. Dr. A is going to see many more recurrences than Dr. B. It doesn't mean that if, if they have the same patient, they should, they should treat them differently. So presentation doesn't mean that you have to treat them other than the ATA guidelines. So if you have two groups with different baseline characteristics, they're going to get different treatments and have different outcomes. So what do we have in the literature of familial disease. We have several studies demonstrating familial disease has more aggressive presentation and they also have worse outcome. Now that makes sense, right? The same number of studies show that they have more aggressive presentation, but they have similar outcome. Now that's interesting. You can say they respond better because they start worse and they have similar outcome. So they seem to respond well to surgery and radioiodine. So that's interesting. Our study with Professor Ben Bassat, they had exactly the same presentation, treatment, and outcome, and only one study with similar presentation and worse outcome. So it's really hard to say how to treat patients according to these studies. And these are many studies. What we really need is matching. We need the same baseline characteristics between two studies, patients to get the same treatment, and then see the outcome and see if they respond the same way to, out, to, to treatment. So the biggest study was from China, 372 familial cases matched for baseline characteristics, same treatment, no difference in recurrence or mortality. Another study, a little bit more complicated to interpret because the two group had different treatments. So fam familial cases had less thyroidectomy, less radioiodine, and had worse outcome, but it's hard to say why that is. And another Canadian study, a small one, uh, 24 patients matched, no difference in recurrence. So overall, regarding therapy, there's insufficient data to say familial thyroid cancer has worse response to therapy, even if they have more advanced disease at presentation, they can be treated according to ATA guidelines, uh, the regular risk adapted therapy that we use. Now, just to mention, now there are many uh, patients that we offer active surveillance for. Again, in patients with familial disease, more than three involved members, affected members, maybe they have a genetic tendency, maybe they have more growth, we really don't know what's the natural history once we find it. And if we don't go to surgery, we don't know what's going to happen. So maybe they're not the best candidates for this approach. So the take home message, screening is reasonable in families with three or more affected members uh, based on high detection rate. We need to be careful not to over treat and treatment, there's really insufficient data to recommend more aggressive therapy once you diagnose the patient. Um, and so we should treat them according to, to how we treat sporadic patients. 
just one last note, when we treat families, it's easy to say not to screen, it's easy to say um, not to treat them differently, but many times when we treat these families, they speak with each other, they worry about each other. If you don't tell them to do an ultrasound, many of them will have an ultrasound. If they have someone with aggressive disease, many times other family members will choose the maximalistic approach and choose to have more surgery or more radioiodine, higher activities of radioiodine. So it's a unique case when you treat a disease, you treat the patient, and you also treat the family to get the best outcome. Thank you. So Camilo is going to um, ask that people um, re, uh, rethink their responses to the first question that we posed. And um, if we could take the poll again here. Okay, so uh, we're going to go back to this 39-year-old female with family history of FPTC that comes to a routine checkup. During the consult, she asked her physician if she should have a uh, neck ultrasound performed since her mother was diagnosed with thyroid cancer around that same uh, age. And at this time, uh, you explained to your patient that screening for familial non medullary thyroid carcinoma is indicated never, since it could lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment, only in patients with one or more family members with PTC, only in patients with two or more family members with PTC, or only in patients who present with symptoms. Great. Um, well, in the interest of time, I um, thank you, Camilo, and thank you, Ayal and, and Joanna, for outstanding presentations here. So what I would like to do is try to get to um, some of the questions before uh, the end of the hour here. Um, I guess one of my, if you could comment on this, one of the challenges I face um, from an intellectual perspective, certainly um, one needs to have very long-term follow-up in order to answer the question um, of whether or not the opposite lobe in a patient who presents with early stage disease is at risk. One would imagine that if you, um, if you have a familial predisposition, the entire thyroid um, is uh, at equal risk of um, developing disease and um, at some point in a patient's lifetime. And um, it's somewhat similar to the population of patients who uh, develop early stage thyroid cancer who have been exposed to radiation um, early in life. I wonder if you could comment on this. I have an, um, it, it is challenging me for me to uh, not recommend doing a total thyroidectomy, notwithstanding all of the um, inherent risks associated with um, performing that surgery. Ayal or Joanna, can you comment on that? Um, oh, yeah. Joanna, do you want to start? Sure, I can, uh, I can start. Um, so, um, um, as you noticed in our cohort, uh, we actually did have patients who uh, chose to undergo a hemithyroidectomy. And I think that uh, it needs to be shared individualized decision making and, and the patient needs to understand that yes, there is some genetic background uh, and the disease um, may equally affect both lobes. But if uh, we have clearly completely negative ultrasound of, uh, on, on one side uh, and single tiny nodule on the other side uh, and so awaiting risks and benefits during the discussion of the patients with the risks being higher um, um, even in a high volume surgeons for hemithyroidectomy compared with total thyroidectomy uh, I, I think that uh, um, as long as appropriate surveillance is uh, warranted um, it is reasonable to, to pursue a uh, less aggressive treatment, hemithyroidectomy. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if, I, uh, if our patients or myself would be comfortable with active surveillance, as I all uh, noticed, uh, for um, suspicious looking thyroid nodule uh, um, 
to, to just watch it. Um, we, uh, we have discussed this with our patients. None of them was interested in such an um, approach, but there were patients interested in hemithyroidectomy given uh, good, uh, uh, robust uh, follow-up uh, plan. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Um, and if you look at patients with advanced disease, patients who die of thyroid cancer, patients who get systemic therapies, only a tiny minority of them have familial disease. It seems like the familial tendency and the, the drive towards uh, cancer is pretty weak. I think most of these people, before we had an ultrasound, most of these families probably lived their lives without knowing about thyroid cancer, that's what I think. Uh, but if you look at the, the most advanced disease, you don't find many patients with familial disease. So overall, I think we shouldn't be too aggressive treating them and they have to understand that they need long-term follow-up. Now, many patients need long-term follow-up. Patients who have benign affirma uh, cytology need long-term follow-up so having a yearly ultrasound is not such a big price to pay and many patients prefer not to have total thyroidectomy in terms of quality of life not taking a pill risks of surgery so it's it's a discussion many times they want more aggressive disease if they have pressure from their family and if they don't have pressure from the family many times they want less aggressive therapy so it's really we don't have high quality evidence for long-term natural history of the disease. So we have to tailor what we do to the patient. And, and I think closer to how we treat sporadic disease than, than going very aggressively. Uh, and just to go back uh, also to, to these patients who underwent hemithyroidectomy in our cohort, as I mentioned, we, we stopped uh, our landmark was 2015. Uh, we have uh, acquired uh, additional follow-up data. We will be analyzing uh, them. So we will see what happened with uh, these patients who underwent hemithyroidectomy as uh, initial therapy. Again, the numbers will be uh, small, uh, but uh, maybe some information will be delivered from it. Great. Um, so, Joanna, if I could just ask you, in, in the structure of, of your study, there were um, roughly 20% of the known thyroid cases, um, 13 um, in, uh, exactly, um, were eliminated. Do you know which of the, of the cohorts would have been enriched, um, whether it be the two, two family or three family members, um, if you had included those patients? Oh, uh, you know, I don't have the answer to this question on top of my uh, head, if they belonged to uh, families with two or three members uh, affected. Um, this is a good point just to rule out any bias uh, at baseline. Um, and we compared these families based on uh, age, gender and tumor characteristics at, at baseline and did not find any difference. But I don't recall uh, the data on those excluded patients. Uh, so I will uh, need to follow up on that, go back to our source data and give you the answer. I just don't remember my apologies. Yeah, no, pro no problem. So one last question um, I would pose is that obviously this is a monumental effort in order to bring family members in to screen them. And I congratulate you on that. Um, there was a difference between the two cohorts in the, of uh, 71 versus 55 percent of members of um, kindred that were screened. How does that influence the way you think about this study and interpret your data? Yeah, so, you know, um, this is what we have had available at the time and, you know, we post this information. This is what um, in, um, uh, Raw, raw data, our, our um, information delivered to the family, are you willing to participate in yearly screening, um, um, are you willing to, to come to the NIH or perform the ultrasounds uh, locally on yearly basis. And this is just, you know, what, uh, what we um, 
have uh, 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 encountered and found. If anything, you know, uh, more aggressive screening in our cohort occurred in, in families with two or more, uh, with two members affected, right? They, uh, more than 70% were screened uh, on yearly basis. So, uh, and yet, despite that, we were uh, detecting uh, higher numbers of thyroid cancer and families with three or more members uh, affected. So I think that uh, the overall conclusion could hold. And if we screened more members of those families with three, I would anticipate that we may, um, uh, I mean, I, I should not uh, actually, uh, uh, comment because the data can go either way, uh, but uh, you know, the signal is there already despite uh, lower number of patients screened. <clears throat> Very good. Um, you sound like uh, many of the pundits who are trying to predict the outcome of the United States election here. Um, so, <laughs> how do we stand right now? I, I you know, I was close to the <laughs> to the <this thing. laughs> So, on, on that note, um, I want to thank you both and thank everyone who um, uh, was in attendance today. We appreciate your support and um, thank you for an, uh, Joanna and yeah uh, for an outstanding presentation. Everybody stay safe and hope we see you again next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.